part and parcel of the Christian life is to study scripture, of course. We've gone over that. And what you study, you learn and practice, actually, uh, in defending it. Contend for the faith. That's another passage uh, study that I've done. Jude 3 and Philippians 1, 27, 28, 29 talks about defending what you believed in the scriptures. Some of them are about the gospel. A lot of times it is, especially first or second or third hand conversations with an individual. Uh, just uh, recently I came across somebody who stood up before a congregation several times and asked to pray after the service was over. And what she prayed was not a prayer. <clears throat> it was a, a statement that she believed that uh, the only thing that uh, uh, should people should pay attention to are what Jesus said in the scriptures. Uh, so throw out all of Paul's writings and all the others <clears throat> and the Old Testament and only the red letter Bible, so those, those Bibles that, that have in red letters uh, what Jesus said. And that should be your own teaching. The only problem with that is they didn't have red ink when they wrote the manuscripts years ago. And what about the Old Testament with Jesus uh, uh, sites all the time. I've just begun on this topic. Uh, I'm not usually going to show people the work in progress, but actually you should because this is instructional to me and to others. How do you start off with a, a problem like this? You have to gather some facts and you don't know precisely how you're going to gather them and what's going to come up. Maybe you can support what you're saying, maybe you can't. So the question is, who is the believer's teacher? Uh, and this is prompted by what I should actually write here. I'm going to type it now. Some contend, capital C, that only Jesus is to be your teacher. Now, if you have any suggestions, no one else. Not even Paul. Wow. Wow. Because who taught poor? Paul? Well, if you're ignorant of lots of the scriptures and what they say, whether you accept them or not, you have to understand that who taught Paul everything he wrote? Jesus did. <clears throat> but you can't <clears throat> follow the argument and reduce it to a rebuttal because they say you can't use Paul's writings to refute the idea that only Jesus is to be the teacher because you're presuming that his Paul, Paul's writings have some legitimacy. Well, then you only have to start, you start off with what Jesus actually said and then go with that, drink, draw that to its conclusion to see if you can only limit yourself, you have to only limit yourself to what Jesus said. <clears throat> so, I just thought of something just now discussing this. The Bible is not a complete record. Jesus said many other things. It's even said, stipulated in the New Testament. And uh, it's uh, evident, self-evident, because he went around talking over and over and over again, he get many, many discussions with many people, some tens of thousands of people there gathered, and said many more things than are recorded. These are short uh, gospels, which we're trying to, she's trying to limit us to. Uh, they, they're very small uh, studies. And you have uh, so many more times and accounts that it could have been repetitive, but nevertheless, a lot of new things we don't know. So if you say you limit yourself to what Jesus said, well, most of it's not recorded. This is only the significant stuff that's recorded in the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So what do you do with everything else? And by the way, uh, the recording of what Jesus said is the, uh, the hearing, the reading, the understanding, the memory, <clears throat> and the writing by the writers of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew and John are disciples of Jesus, and he was present with them. But Luke was not present. He used eyewitnesses and did a good job at that. But you can't use what he said because it's possibly misquoted. It's hearsay. Can you say in court, well, my friend told me, he's not here in court, but this is what my friend told me, that uh, what happened. You can't use that because the friend's not there to authenticate this is what he said. So Luke has to authenticate what Jesus said on his own witness, but he's not. And what about Mark? He was not a disciple of Jesus either. <clears throat> so already... We've refuted that argument and have to limit it so severely that it doesn't uh, make sense already. So, anyway, let's. if you have any other thoughts about this, send them in to me. Just email them. Go to my website and click on the email button. But I wanted to write this, what I just said. So, 
Point number six, see how I'm gathering information? I, it's not organized yet. That's how you operate. Unless you have a brilliant mind, mine isn't so brilliant. So point seven, point number seven, <clears throat> the, uh, the four Gospels only provide a small, I can reword this, amount of what Jesus said. There evidently were many, he says, how about many twice, many, many more things that Jesus said that have not been recorded. So we have an incomplete record of what he said. Furthermore, Gospels were the work of four men who had to recall what Jesus said and then write it down. So we are not getting the direct teachings of our Lord because he did not write them down himself. So we take what this person's statements are literally, <coughs> and we don't have Jesus' teaching at all. We have just two people, two of the authors were actually disciples of Jesus and heard his words. Okay, but Mark and Luke did not hear is Jesus' words. Now, if you have any other things to add on this, we're going to go over what I've written so far. Help me on this. I'm just beginning this. Now, the statement this woman made used Matthew 23, 1 to 12. Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the, in the chair of Moses, so they have some authority. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe. But do not do according to their deeds, for they say things and do not they for they say things and do not do them. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. So this is not a lesson on who should be your teacher, but they do all their deeds to be noticed by men. For they broaden their phylacteries and lengthen their tassels of their garments. They love the place of honor at banquets and the chief seats in the synagogues and respectful greetings in the marketplace places and being rabbi by men, because being called rabbi by men. So I'm just going over the passage this woman cited to see if it's relevant about Jesus should be your only teacher. But do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher. Okay, that's is that Jesus? Evidently, how do we interpret that? It's probably as Jesus is your, your teacher, and you are all brothers. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. See, this is not only the subject that Jesus is the only teacher. This is the, your, your key teacher, your final authority teacher, perhaps. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts shall be humbled, and whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. So this is, I've got the Bible Knowledge Commentary written down here. I'm going to sort through this to see how accurate it is and what I'm going to keep and what I don't, because this is uh, another man's 
writing and what he thinks this passage in uh, Matthew 23, 1 to 12. So you tell me what you think it says and tell me whether it's relevant to instruct us in this passage alone. You're only to listen to what Jesus wrote, so what's recorded by him. Okay, so you can read that. This is the file. Bible study manuals slash teacher, T-E-A-C-H-E-R dot H-T-M. Now, I'm actually going on the original file that I'm going to post. And we're going to go through it, rewrite it, write it, rewrite it. This is how you study something. You don't just take somebody's word for it. I wouldn't take Bible, a Bible knowledge commentary and slap it and send it to somebody unless I quoted it. I just quoted it here. I might have to sort through it and see what's relevant and what is not. All about context. Now, I made some points. Point number one, if Jesus is to be one's only teacher, then in this age one does not have him available to teach one or anyone because his presence as teacher is not there. He's not here, but in heaven. <clears throat> instead, he declared that he has sent the Holy Spirit to be the believer's teacher in his stead. Now, can anybody recall a passage or two that says this? I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming from memory. So, if Jesus is to be your own only teacher, but the Holy Spirit is supposed to be your teacher, so do, am I? Have I refuted this woman, or is she? Is she what's she going to say? She's going to say, "Well, Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father are one." So, but the presence isn't like the presence Jesus spoke to to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, <laughs> and uh, the recording of Jesus's words are even indirect to us through the authors two of which are disciples and two of whom are not. So the Holy Spirit is the teacher who is received at the moment one believes in the gospel and not, not Jesus per se, his personality of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Upon believing the gospel, the individual receives the gift of the Holy Spirit as a deposit, Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, whose job, whose job, I'm checking my spelling here, it is to be that individual's teacher. Well, if Jesus gave a lecture on this subject, and here's Matthew 23 as the proof text of it, where is that individual thing? Oh, by the way, when I go up to ascend, I'll be in heaven, I'm going to leave the Holy Spirit with you on earth. So, we have the other passages, John 14, 6. For the counsel of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and will remind you of everything I've said to you. So, he, you're to be reminded of everything Jesus said to the disciples, but he didn't say anything to me specifically. So uh, maybe there's some other things that I should know the Holy Spirit will tell me. This, kind of, this woman's idea of theology isn't very complete, but you have to res be responsible to do a thorough job because I've already run into this quite a bit. They call that the red letter churches where they only go and they only read the red letters. They don't even bother reading the the text in dark black letters surrounding the red letters. They just say that, which, how do you know the context until you build it up? Matthew, Jesus said in Matthew 23 these things, but what did the Pharisees say to him? Okay. Matthew chapter 22, look at this, Matthew chapter 22 is how they carried themselves up. The hypocrisy and unbelief of the nation's religious leaders evidenced in chapter 22. You're not allowed to read chapter 22 because it's not what Jesus said. Well, then how do you know what he's responding to? It's it's not uh, all that great. So, point number two, the recorded sayings of Jesus were not recorded or written by himself in Scripture, but by others who wrote the Gospels, and even a few lines from Jesus did, did Paul write in his epistles. So, Paul is quoting Jesus. Why isn't Paul allowed? <clears throat> the disciples accepted Paul as an apostle. Why can't... Uh, this be acceptable, his writings to us. And that included Paul's account to them, evidently, of how he got saved and the Lord Jesus Christ in his resurrection body. They didn't question that. And the Lord's teaching of Paul in the Arabian desert to what he uh, actually responded to was writing his epistles. <clears throat> There's no objection by the disciples in their writings. Didn't say, don't listen to what Paul has to say. And Paul was around them. And they accepted him. Point number three, note that Luke and Mark were not even Jesus' disciples. I have to do my spell check here on this too. Point number four, the writers of the Gospels and the letters of the New Testament were in effect teaching others as they often quoted what Jesus said and did. 
So they were the actual teachers. They just have 